Good morning. Good morning. This is Wednesday. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much for coming today. I feel like church. Y'all are sitting like five rows back. <laughs> um, before I get started on the budget thing, um, Will and I were on three different conference calls yesterday uh, with the coronavirus and how is it we can make sure that we take care of ourselves, take care of our students, take care of your families and um, what to worry about, what not to worry about. And if you look at the CDC, um, they'll tell you that travel is safe, but you want to be careful. Um, they tell you that make sure you wash your hands 20 seconds with soap, with warm water, 20 seconds, warm water, soap. And um, I went to an event last night for executive women and we did a lot of elbowing and rather than fist bumping rather than shaking hands. Um, just simple things. Uh, there's an interesting article that I read yesterday from New York Times that compares with a Spanish on, and I think this is something that takes a long time to do, but everybody's working on it, and the more we can focus, the better is a retention. And we're going to show you some of the things that might happen. Uh-oh, Paul, am I doing something? You're scratching your head. Is it okay? No, no, no. Okay, good. <laughs> um, uh, I think some of the, I just want to show you what some of the impacts might be if we can improve some of our, re, our retention uh, rates, freshman and sophomore, sophomore to junior, junior to senior. Having some of these new doctoral programs is fabulous because I really think that that helps. It's a committed group of people. I know with our doctoral program in community college leadership, we were at Middlesex yesterday signing some agreements with them. They are over the moon about the program. They love it. It's high quality. Uh, it's something you would want. We should be very proud of the good things that we're doing. Uh, we just gotta stay, as I fondly say it frequently, in our lane with our spending. And that's the piece that we wanna talk a little bit with you about today. So I'm gonna turn over to Jim, um, and he and Lewis will probably be the only two people in here who understand every line of this. <laughs> I told him I'm gonna have a CPA degree when I'm through with this. So uh, we will take questions afterwards, but I want you to, if you could watch what he's talking about, and then I'm going to talk about some things at the end, and then we can kind of talk about how, what's, what's, what do we do moving forward. Uh, one other thing that's a good thing, fundraising is up. Uh, yesterday, finally, uh, I have gotten a $10 million commitment from uh, Frank Greeny, and yesterday, uh, Kui, you should have received the first five, correct? Okay, so that's five. <laughs> We will probably get the other five in about six months. So we have to keep doing this. We have to keep finding other opportunities. And he created um, for our foundation board. Quee's done a great job of increasing our foundation board. And this is some of the fundraising things we're doing for some of the areas. So that's our next thing to do is how do we do find other monies to make sure that we can be resilient. So anyway, I'll let you get to do now. I told my family this morning, I've been giving so many speeches the last two weeks, I feel like I'm running for office. And they asked, how would you do in Jersey? I'm like, I wouldn't get any delegates, but at least I know my numbers. <laughs> it's a good thing going forward. So we'll talk a little bit today about a couple of the sections. Some of these you've probably seen before. But in general terms, I always think it's good to have an historical perspective of who we are as an organization. You kind of see us transitioning with our assets on the left-hand side from like 288 million to 347. It kind of likely reflects the fact that we've enhanced our capital assets that likely yield regard to the West Campus housing project. And our liabilities on that right hand side kind of reflect the fact that we took on some obligations with regard to long term debt. But we also took on some obligations with regard to the pension liability, which is sort of the $150 million on the, on, on the far right there. So what we've really been trying to look at is sort of where are our strengths and weaknesses on our balance sheet. So some of our strengths on our balance sheet, again, running for office. Um, would be that we've got an asset portfolio that includes dorms and things like that. One of our risks is the fact that our cash and our resources have been strained. We've been utilizing our resources for cash with regard to projects, and we've been managing our cash pretty closely now for the last year or so in, in a very progressive manner. So we've got a strong asset base, but we're concerned a little bit about our cash flow. We've got our liabilities, we've been actually paying that obligation off. And our net asset unrestricted position reflects the fact that of the 43,167 we see there in fiscal 2014 to the 122, a lot of that is the pension issue, but not everything is the pension issue. So we're kind of concerned about that um, as an organization. Second thing we've talked a lot about in the last year. Sure. Um, the pension issue, again, and I'm new to the state of New Jersey, is the fact that in, in simple terms, they've taken the pension liability that exists for the state and kicked it to the schools. 
They said, we have an obligation here, let's just say $150 million. They said, okay, Jim, that, that's your piece. My sense is that if we went and had the issue, they'd likely pay off the pension for us, but they're saying it's your liability gets it off their books, so it is kind of passing it around. But in a sense, you're kicking it down to the school level, which is problematic because it makes our numbers look worse, but we can tease out that piece um, as we talk about a little bit. So the second thing we looked at over the last year or so has been that our revenue portfolio is very highly leveraged from my perspective, which means that we're looking at a situation where we're tuition dependent and dependent on the state. We don't have a base with regard to significant research or endowment or fellowships or scholarships coming in. So we're really saying that tuition for us being a lever is problematic when it's a lever that goes in the opposite direction. So we've got our state allocation there for operating of 24.2, 25.6 for the fringes of the past year. So anything we can necessarily do here to enhance and diversify revenue is going to help us. Again, fundraising from what the President mentioned a few uh, minutes ago is also helpful. The second area in which we become increasingly concerned is the lever that is a struggle for us is the fact that most of our cost structure from an accounting perspective is fixed. So if you take 67 and 17, and I'm not great with math, that's like 85%. So 85% of our cost structure is not going away. It's there every week, every month, Rosemary and I process the payroll with Dinesh. And that's a situation where what I mean by that is the fact that that's a cost that's going to go on whether or not we want to or not, which means it leaves us with the range of around $25 million of a $165 million budget that we can actually cut and manage. It's not a lot of money. I think you can all verify we've cut your budget as much as possible every Monday. It's what we do every Monday, cut the budget, cut the budget, cut the budget. But the difficulty is we don't know what to do because where else can you cut if you're looking at a portfolio that is really fixed and will not change at least in the short term. That has been our struggle, that we've got a leverage situation with regard to revenue and also a very difficult cost structure with regard to it. So from an accounting perspective here, the break even we're looking at is the fact that we need to get above that 112 and 27 to even get to that point with regard to being above water with regard to financial operations. Now we started with our operating capital budget when I started last year and I've kind of worked through the model here with regard to where we want to end up with regard to fiscal 20, 21, 22, and 23. This is a helpful mo Yes, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, right. So the operating budget really looks at here at our compensation, $86 million, fringe of 22, depreciation of 10, $6 million for debt service, scholarships and waivers, utilities. All those numbers are pretty set, just in general terms, which means they're not gonna change going forward. If you see the difference between fiscal 20 and 21, we've assumed at some point now that the AHAR and more adjustment will occur, which we think is going to occur going into fiscal 21. It likely would not be a program that goes away, but likely would be sort of managed more from 120 students to more like 70 to 75 going forward. But we're trying to project out for a couple years to see where there are opportunities of vulnerabilities for us as a campus going forward. So we're looking at this and kind of working it through. But again, the 166 being my baseline is where I need revenue to be. And if revenue isn't at 166, then I need to sort of adjust the spending, which is why we're probably talking about a different model now for fiscal 21, 22, and 23. Our capital budget is basically us saying we've got about 12.973. But out of that amount, when you, again, when you go through here, $6 million is debt service for the bonds. Got to pay that off. We've got some issues with regard to capital lease, technology, replacement, repairs. When you get right down to it, the last numbers on this schedule here, 1.214, 407, 1495, and 11. That's our entire capital budget. I can verify with Lewis, we received about $6.5 million in requests last year for capital projects and likely funded in the range of a million five. We have to sort of be judicious with our resources going forward, which means we can't fund everything coming in, even though it's a reasonable request going forward. So the operating capital budgets have been strained in terms of being looking at our resources, but not in terms of understanding there's a need on campus to fund these projects going forward. So uh, fiscal 20 and 20. On the capital projects, so uh, you have all experienced, I know, either a classroom or an office that's too hot or too cold or too something. Uh, and that is because our infrastructure is, is very uh, thinking and it needs to be redone. Um, we will be able to get it redone using an E3. And the way the E3 model would work is a company would come in, agree to build a new 
So one thing I think we've probably done since July, since the summer, is we've really tried to engage the community, the vice presidents, the president, dean, directors, et cetera, provost, in looking at our revenues and expenses on a weekly basis. Not that you like us talking about this every Monday, although it is kind of what we end up doing. I think what we've really tried to do is inform the community about our budgets, typically based on where we are in terms of the year. So what I mean by that is, if you look at the middle column there, it says enrollment adjustments. We got into summer session two and said, where are we versus the budget? We get into the fall, the spring, the winter session. So every time we see a benchmark, we'll say, okay, where are we positioned wise with regard to the budget? So a couple of good things, in the fall and winter, we were up versus budget. In the summer and spring, we look like we we're gonna be a little bit down, and the summer session for one, we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. But we're trying to look at the profile we have there and see where we are financially every time we sort of tick off a particular point. So a couple things we look at there is the fact with the $4.1 million adjustments in our enrollment targets, that's a $4.1 million adjustment that comes off the budget. And if the budget's only $20 million, that's a massive cut to the community. We get that, but the difficulty is there isn't a lot of other places we can necessarily cut going forward. Um, I've actually been more familiar now this probably last three months than I probably was last year with the OMB allocation. And I don't know if it's appropriate to say this, but I think OMB has supported NJCU. I don't want to say something that you don't believe in, but I felt like they've actually has supported us with initiatives, which I think from what I've heard in the past is not the case. So it's been great for me to sort of see they've given us a million dollars from Monmouth, some additional resources. So it's actually been a very positive experience for me being here for a period of time. So the OMB allocation has felt more solid to me this year than it did necessarily last year. We have an adjustment for the A. Harry Moore School there, which is a pass-through. We brought the number down from 7.14 to 5.6, primarily because we went from enrollment of 120 to 70, 75. So that's kind of a numbers go down for revenue, but also numbers go down for spending as well. But it is a $6 million cut to a budget that really couldn't afford it. And that's one thing we want to work on for fiscal 21. So primarily that's our sort of adjustment there. We had some modest adjustments here with regard to other categories as well, but the primary issue is we've gone from $166 million last summer to around 161. So we're kind of working on that as an initiative going forward. Again, enrollment is a tuition driver for us. It's also a driver for us with regard to our budgeting model. Then we look at our spending model here. And a couple things struck us as being interesting this year. For NJCU salaries, we've really drawn the line in the sand about adding new positions, replacing positions, and really sort of taking a fairly strict policy on that. So we expect to have about savings at this point of about a million dollars in salary savings from not replacing positions. We think it could go as high to a million five. Uh, Lewis can verify that every other week, so I guess with tomorrow's, what's tomorrow, uh, Friday's payroll. So every time we have a payroll on campus, we get a report from the payroll office in HR that says, here's what your payroll looks like. We run it every single Friday we have payroll and check where we're going to be in the budget. We do it down to the last person on campus. So we're very specific with regard to payroll. So we're expecting it to be about a million to a million five below where we're going, which is going to be savings. The area in which we're somewhat concerned is it feels like we might be trending over on contract employees, overtime, and adjuncts. And maybe that's something we want to work on this year. But the savings from the personnel helps. The savings that we went over budget here and the other one doesn't help. But I think that we'll probably be more informed this year as the budgeting process gets into high gear in March to kind of talk about these things and think what your needs are for contract employees, student assistance, et cetera. So we're trending to sort of be a little bit above where we expected to be on that grouping net. And we've got some other categories here with adjustments. But I think what we're looking at now is the fact that when we started July 1st, and this is an important benchmark we want to stop. When July 1st hit, we were about a million nine to two million dollars off in the budget, which meant Lewis, our distinguished budgeting colleague here, couldn't fund payroll. And I said, I think payroll's important in July. People want to get paid. They're like that on campus. They're difficult to get along with. So we kind of had to fund a budget that wasn't done in July to make payroll allow us to sort of go through that process. We've been tracking about a $2 million deficit for the last six to nine months. We identified it on July, on January 31st at around $6 million. In the last month or so, we found about three. We're trending to go from six to three to balance over the next four months, but it's an uphill climb. And where we are now is I feel more positive today than I felt on January 31st, but that does change. It's the morning, in the afternoon, it'll all be coming to a crashing halt at some point. That's the theory. You never know. Lewis is back. He was sick yesterday. He'll bring me down by four. I'll be good. I'll be back at that. But we think we found about $3 million. We do tend to work on these things. Anything we find is an opportunity to sort of realize savings out of the revenue plans we tend to put together. But it's an uphill climb, and I think when you look at that $6 million, it's primarily, unfortunately, enrollment trip. 
It's, it's how our cost structure is set up. So the one thing I think with message for Fitch and Moody's who do our ratings and also the board is the fact that we want to align our cost structure with our enrollment. We want to make sure that how we're spending our money fits with the enrollment pattern we're seeing now for the fall, spring, and summer. I'll stop if you have questions now and we can continue on. Yes, please. Sure. Yes. So, um, I'm not an accountant, so I probably don't need any more accountants. On I probably need some help interpreting yes. numbers and terminologies. And this is not particularly about your charts, but um, in an email that President Henderson sent out in February, she said, over six years, there's been at least $30 million loss in net assets collectively. Yes. Yeah. And then if you look at the NJCU financial reports that are available on the web, it says net position in 2013 was 105.9 positive in the plus column. 2014 was 108.8. That slide right there, the bottom section, the net position, the 108. The right, and then it says for 2019, the net position of the university was negative 47.9 million. So that seems to be, over six years, that seems to be a loss of over 150 million. But I think that she's probably referring to, if you look up on that slide there, that 150.813 in fiscal 2018, that net pension. That might be also the 151.813 on the far right. I don't have a pointer, I'm sorry. So what happens, let me explain a little bit that, because in one year, see how it went from 100, whoops. We're good. Jim. <laughs> You're good now. So, so we went up. from 108 to the positive, and then that next year we were suddenly like in the negative, and that was the year the, the world, the, the accounting standards called GASB 68 says you get to take on the liability of the pension. We don't fund it. We I don't collect the money for it, but the state does. So the state said, you all get to, you know, we're still going to collect the money for it, but if everything goes sour, then you have, we're going to give you the financial liability for it. Now, it's, it's a paper thing. So we went in one year from 108 to, I lost, it was $115 million. It's on, it's on, it's on paper. It's not cash. It's, your, it's, 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 a, it's an accounting standard. So every year, every year that gets worse, and it gets worse because more people are, are in that pension system. So every year the state calls us up and says, well, I know last year you had to subtract 115. Next year you're going to have to subtract a total of 125. They tell us. As I said, I'm not an accountant, but when, when your statement said there was a loss of $30 million, right. and I look at the 2019 financial report, and it has... 47.9 in parentheses, which I understand. Right. I think the president was referring to working capital, though, which she was referring to. I was working, I was talking about our operating budget. Which is more working capital. Which yeah. Is sort of I, see, that's where I don't quite understand the difference between net position and operating budget. But So, I don't, so you and I are going to need to go to, <laughs> I've learned it. So there, there's a difference, and I've had to explain this, uh, well, every president's had to explain it. Is so there's actually the cash you have on hand, okay? And... Uh, so the piece that we look at, and I, where is it? Uh, unrestricted net position? No, not that one. Um, liabilities? Where is it? Yeah. So total liabilities and net positions, 347. That's before you've taken out, uh, I don't know how to explain this to you. Jim, you explain it. It's, it's an account. What happens is, here's, your, here's the money you have at the end of the year. Now subtract out this GASB 68 thing. Like if I was to go to the books at William Patterson or Rimapo or College in New Jersey, they ha all have to do the same thing. You have to subtract to every year. We had $40 million in cash on hand. We likely have now 10 as of June of, of 19. When she's referring to this, when you look at the net investment in capital assets, it went up from 57 299 to 86 We're investing in the campus. Sometimes you use your cash to invest in the West Campus housing or other elements of the campus community. Well, I guess my follow-up question would be then, if our net position has gone from 108 in the plus to 36 million in the minus, is that a sustainable model for a university? I think what the president would say is if you look at the 158.13 on the net pension liability and take it out from the 122, that gives us a position of like 28 million. That might be another model. If you, I, I don't have a point. I don't want to shut up. Sue's going to get mad at me. But 
The net pension liability is 158, 13. Take that out of the 122.631 over here. That means we have 20 million net assets. Because the 150 is a paper type of pension obligation. We wouldn't have to pay. Can I ask a question? Well, I, I would just, uh, I just say respectfully, I don't get it. So, so, Jim, what you have to show them, remember, I, so we have to show them what our position is, and then you say, here's the GASB 68. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And that, like I said, that's actually how they started doing it, a lot of my peer institutions, because it would help the board understand. Because the GASB thing is, is simply an accounting thing you have to put down. No. So no. I don't understand this, these calculations. I mean, okay. I do film budgets, and <laughs> I don't understand where, where, you know, how this is shown. If you, if you, if you, I know it's very complicated, yep. but it seems like we're in debt. Are we in debt or not? Are we in debt in terms of? It's a very simple question. I, I mean, no, I don't, I don't think debt? it's, no, when you say, I'll, I'll, are you saying, do we have debt or are we in debt? Your question is, what do I look at with regard to the 122? I take the 15813, adjust it against the 122, and I have 28 million in net assets. So uh, this, the, here's, really, here's the, here's the, the budget, correct. The cost of the school, right. The university of the year. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the thing that, uh, that we get up every day and have to worry about is the operating budget. That 347 at the bottom is all the buildings, it's everything, it's all our assets. Um, so that all gets together. Yes, that's gone up because we've added some assets here. The, the piece to it that's kooky to me, uh, even with your, your operating, it's not even dropping because it, it doesn't even hit your operating budget. It hits, it hits after that is the GASB because that's something that every year we have to subtract more money up. It's, it's usually about a six or seven to eight million dollars more that we have to put down as, as the pension liability. But if you take that out, the, the question is how is our operating budget working? Does that help, Rudy? At all? No, I, you know, Sue, the, the, the reality is mm -hmm. that everybody's predicting enrollment's going to go down, mm -hmm. whereas our expenditures seem to be going up. And that seems to be a, a disconnect. And reality is classes are getting canceled, departments are going to be shut down, layoffs are going to happen. This is a real situation that faculty and students have to deal with. And it seems like there's a giant disconnect that is, that is I don't understand what's happening. I don't know why yeah. this, we, we are expanding all these plans mm -hmm. when everything is shutting down. It seems to me the wrong thing. And, the, and, and you know the, the idea of strangling the line for the fruit. There'll be no students, there'll be no retention when all the classes get canceled because mm -hmm. of the adjunct budget. You know, I the adjunct budget's gone up. If you, it's gone from six million to nine million. Yeah, so, the, and it stayed there. It hasn't gone down in the last five years. It stayed at nine million. I can show you that one because I look at that one every year. Yeah. yeah. So I'm trying. I'm struggling like everyone else yeah. to make sense of this. And, and so what? What Joel has pointed out it seems to be there was a major change from 2014 to 2015. Mm -hmm. So we were in the black in 2014, and then we went into the red in 2015. Because of the Gatsby. I mean, I think that, let's just, say, let's just say last year we lost money. This year we're trying to break even. We're trying to go from a $13 million loss last June to break an even in 12 months. So it's a steep climb to break $13 million as a deficit structural. So there's a structural deficit we're trying to work on. This and that's the operating doing. budget. The operating budget. The income right. budget. I think our first year is next year? Yeah, we're going to talk about that towards the end of the budget. Okay. And that's, that's a, what would be good for you all to see is another presentation on how that all works. So, yes, we, we said, yes, we'll let you come in and build a building, but you've got to give us a ground lease. 
Here's the thing you have to understand about the ground leases. Um, we originally, when we signed the deal, said, okay, it's $400,000, and by the way, we have to build the road because that's what you do as a developer. Well, I don't want to, you know, that's expensive. It was $222 million. We uh, borrowed $36 million four years, four or five years ago for the purpose of doing many things. The science building came in from the state at $32 million. The building was $42 million. So we had to borrow the other 10 because we wanted to get the building that they deserved. So, okay, we'll put the 10 million towards that. We spent some money to fix the, the school of business. We spent some money to air condition the gym so that we could do the summer camp. So we, now the athletics program can get some money in the summer to run some of their stuff. So we spent some money on that. And then we spent some money fixing some of Margaret Room's theater, mostly the lights, not the rest of it. So that's where all that many, as a matter of fact, uh, Jim and Aaron have discovered that we've got $2.7 million left that we can actually do something with. So we're probably going to be asking you all, but it's all capital. It doesn't buy pencils. <laughs> it doesn't buy pencils, but it does, it, it allows you to fix stuff. So that's a good thing for us. So they are, we've got to get that spent pretty quickly. Um, there's another thing that uh, Jim's going to do that I think will help us. Uh, we have about $180 million in debt, is that right? That's been over the life of this institution when they started borrowing. They had to borrow some money to buy that property over there, of the 22 acres, and it was over a period of time they had to borrow some money to help with the remediation. So anyway, so in my tenure, we borrowed the 32. We did it to do the science building, to do the Mark Williams Theater, to do the, and then we built the first six millions of the roads. The, gov the governor, the mayor then give us another $16 million for the road, which we, we build the road, then they give us the money back. We build the road, they give us the money back. So that road down there is being built by the, the mayor, most of it. About a fourth of it is ours. After it gets done, they keep it clean. So we don't have to pay for security or I don't have to pay for snowblowers. That's a good thing. Um, we will get a ground lease. The ground leases from each of these buildings, what are they, uh, 100000 200000 200,000, 200,000 apiece for each of those apartments. Had we, and the reason they aren't any bigger is the, 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 govern, the mayor said, I'll do the roads, but I'm not going to give you as much credits to the developers as, as, as I might have. So it's $200,000 a, a facility, and then the grocery store brings in 600,000. So it'll be about $1.4 million in revenue each year when it finally all cranks up, and that's about 2025, is that right? 2024, okay. But I'll show you the thing on that one because we're all pretty laser focused on that one. That's revenue that then helps pay for the music, dance, and theater. And if you remember, in 2012, we put two proposals into the state. They had the GO Bonds. The state of New Jersey, bless their hearts, gives you facilities monies once every 20 years. Like in Georgia, they do it every year because they recognize that higher education is important. Not here. But they do give you the opportunity to borrow your own money, you know, do your own thing. So um, we put a bid in for a performing arts center, a facility for, mu uh, for music, dance, and theater, and a facility for science. Uh, Christie's uh, focus at that time was on the sciences. So we got, the, we got the $32 million for it. We're great. We're thrilled. I love the building. And by the way, if you look at the enrollment in biology and chemistry, it's gone up. And that's good. They have good spaces. Um, then we said, okay, we need to help this music, dance, and theater program because it's good and it'll grow and it has grown. Um, so, but we don't have to borrow the money. So that's where we come up, came up with the idea of doing these buildings and using the ground leases. It's kind of common. Um, the building that uh, the College of New Jersey did, their town center there, is done on the same model and Rowan has done a similar model, so has Rutgers. So it's not unusual in the state of New Jersey for you to use, you know, apartments, they pay the ground lease. And by the way, they have to pay the ground lease before they pay their own mortgage. It's the first thing they pay every year. The rivet is full, the other one is half full, and it's, uh, the rents there, by the way, are less than what you pay on the waterfront. And, and then the final project will have some affordable housing in it, which I think is important. Um, so, that's where we, that's all capital. It sits over here in capital. What I, we get up in every day worry about is this operating budget which is the one that comes as a result of the, the enrollment, grants, all those things. I, I was asking Jim when he was at Harvard, you know, it was, how much of their budget comes from tuition? He's like, nothing, you know, because everybody there has to write grants or they have to do some kind of entrepreneurial activities. 
So anyway, so I did, I, did I sort of answer the question with the yes. capital stuff? Trying to, no, I didn't. Uh-oh. What, what, what can I help you with, Joel? No. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Okay. So what I need to do, how, how that happens. Okay. So what I need to do is to show you what it looks like before the Gatsby thing. Does that, does that make sense? The, the year that the Gatsby thing came along, I had to subtract $150 million out of the, the buck. It wasn't real money. It's an accounting thing you have to put down there. And this says, should the state of New Jersey go bankrupt, you will have to figure out how to pay this pension. That's it. But I, but I guess, but I guess, but but I guess, I, but, but I guess to your point, we have to align our cost structure with revenue. And if I look to say here round numbers, I see us being okay. at hundred. Jim, let, let me answer the question on this one. So here's what we need to control. I cannot control how much the state subtracts from my budget every year for Gatsby. I'm not responsible for it. I don't have to pay it. It's simply something that you have to. Put. What I can control is what we actually, what he's talking about. What can we do with our operating budget to make sure that we have good reserves? We spent $12 million as part of that $36 million redoing it. Yeah. That seems like a yep. kind of a, a right place to look mm -hmm. where money's been going. Yep. So I think the challenge for what folks have been talking about so far is the fact that if I look to say I'm going to bring in $155, $160 million in revenue from switching all in, and my cost structure is $169, I need to take the $26.11 there and cut that by $7 million, which is incredibly difficult. Our cost structure is not aligned to our own and our revenue. It's just we're trending to be 155, 160, and our spending is basically all fixed. There's nothing I can cut. You know, what do we look at here as being miscellaneous? It's a real challenge for us in the budget process. It just doesn't align. You waving at me? You want to talk? I like when people, you can wave at me. That's all right. It's a friendly proof. May I? Sure. Um, this is obviously extremely complex and difficult to digest, uh, but impressionistically, we seem to be hearing more now, independent of all of these complex explanations, we seem to be hearing more now that our budget situation as of now is not as good as it was the year before and the year before and the year before. And when we keep hearing that, independent of whatever rationales and numbers and, and sentences that we hear, it appears to us that we're always being said, we're in a bad situation. Ideally, it will get better, but we keep hearing we're in a bad situation. So one comment is, that's not reassuring. Now, now my question. Could you explain the following thing to me? I'm not sure you'll be able to, but maybe someone else will. And I know I'm talking about a small amount of money in regard to this. Someone happened to give to me in 2016 a booklet called uh, The Queen's College Magazine. And it happens to list in 2016 the schools and the donors that made contributions to Queen's College Alumni Association, whatever it is. And quite surprisingly, New Jersey City University is listed, not an individual, but New Jersey City University in 2016 is listed as having contributed to Queens College somewhere between $10,000 and $24,999. So I thought, maybe that's a mistake, maybe someone's generous, and that's a lovely thing to do if people want to donate their own money, that's their own business. But it doesn't have an individual's name. So I didn't do anything about it. Well, the next year someone gave me the equivalent. And there again, in 2017, New Jersey City University is listed as giving between twenty-five dollars and $49,999, again to Queens College. Then, so that's the second year. So I'm thinking, maybe this is not a mistake. So then, someone gives it to me for 2018. So this is the third year in a row. And again, NJCU is listed as a donor for Queens College, again, for that amount. The 2019 one has not come out yet, as opposed to doing it. So somewhere between ten and $25,000 each year, 
they are saying we are giving to them. Is that true? Uh, I wrote a two. I wrote a two thousand dollar check. To in, yeah, I was going to say I will call Lori Dorf this afternoon. I was matter of fact, I'll ask Quee to call her and find out what why that's in there. I haven't been to their galas, and if I go to something like that, that's a personal thing. Absolutely, and that's yeah. your business. Yeah. So the only ones I spend money on, and we have a documentation for it, is uh, Quee has it, and Virginia keeps up with it. Is you know what 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 it is we participate in. So I do not know where that came from, but I, you know what? I will ch chase that one down, and I appreciate that. Well, thank you, because it, That's doesn't, crazy. it doesn't make us look yeah. good. And again, yeah. if it's yeah. your money or someone else's money, no. it's your business, I don't, and I applaud no. you for the most, contributing. Um, here, here's the paperwork. Yeah, this is crazy. Um, I have a... Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it is. And, and I hope that money's not up there. No. Funny. Um, yeah, I would say that the one, the one place where we do buy uh, tables for is the, the Hudson Chamber, simply because we're very involved and because there are a lot of business here. So that's an example of place where we would spend money to buy a table for something like that. I will check on this, and thank you for bringing it to my attention, because <laughs> we don't do this. I never, I, not at that level, ever. By the way, I wouldn't give them anything, so I don't give out any money. People say I say no. They're not getting money from me. I've been. Other questions? I'm sorry. It's on, we, we're going to talk about it next. Okay, so I'm going to hear that before I yeah, get to the next one. Yes, correct. I yeah. want to get out. And I don't want it on the line. I, I want to get, well, I have it on the But on the, the it, 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 it talks about the backs of students, and it talks about reducing faculty. I'd like to see a larger plan in that. Yeah. I'd like to understand it, first yeah. of all. So sure. maybe there's yeah. a way that that can happen. But my question is, you come here. Yeah, and, and I think we went from last summer realizing we had another loss on campus to saying we need to fix it in 12 months. It's hard to go from a $12 million loss, $13 million loss last June to saying we're going to break the budget and balance it. So we've kind of gotten to the point now where we're trying to balance the budget by June, but if you go from $12 million structurally in 12 months, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bridge here for us to get there. So some of the things we've talked about is the provost, the deans, et cetera, have put together a, a tremendously aggressive but really wonderful opportunity for us to do summer sessions one, two, and three, and I think they'll be talking about that, but we see opportunity in summer sessions. We've gone from summer one and summer two to summer one, two, and three, and in my head as an accountant, I think I got two weeks of summer two to claim this year, which is gonna give me more money. And so that's how we think that that gives me two weeks of revenue, that's a million two. We think that helps us in general. Yes? There's a problem with financial aid with the summer classes. Students don't get financial aid. Okay. It's weird. It does run out. Thank God the federal government said you can do it for the full year. The problem is our students like spend it, spend it, and then then we're left. I, I agree with you. That that is an issue. So.
And thank you for bringing that one up. They have, yeah. Okay. So what I hear Chris saying, so for the benefit of the people who are watching, yeah, is that you can get some financial aid in the summer. I do know that you just from last. Well, Scott, you would know this better. Do you know the rules on this one? Um, so the federal government treats summer well. Uh, they give the institution the option of whether you want to treat summer as a header or a trailer in your financial aid year. Most institutions I've been at, including this one, treat summer as a trailer. Um, so it is um, kind of the end of the financial aid year. Um, the downside of that model is students do often end up spending most of their aid eligibility in the fall and the spring. So their loan eligibility, for example, usually just ends up being equally divided between the fall and the spring semester. Um, last year, however, um, the federal government did uh, revise their rules on uh, Pell Grants in particular that do allow students to get some summer Pell money even if they've used their full allocation in the fall and the spring. So it's part of a year-round Pell initiative that they believe will help more students get through um, their studies faster. So there is some um, additional eligibility that is um, available there. And if students went less than full-time in the fall or the spring and are trying to use um, summer sort of in a credit recovery kind of mode, um, whatever aid they didn't use in the fall and the spring would then be available to them um, in the summer as well. But it tends, it, uh, um, to folks' point, it does tend to be uh, less um, available funding for students um, in the summer months. We are looking at our price structure um, in summer um, in response response to this and partially in response to what have, I think we've had like a, about a decade of continued declines in summer enrollment. Um, and there is a sense that some of that might be because of our price point. Um, I have been at other places where summer is actually priced lower than fall and spring in an effort to draw in more students who might be home um, for the summer months and might want to take a class or two to transfer back um, to their um, uh, home institution when they uh, return in the fall. Um, so we are looking at uh, testing um, some discounts um, in the summer months um, for particular programs for students who choose to take nine or more credits. Um, so we are going to look at that, see if it um, boosts enrollment. If it does, then I think we could look at expanding um, some sort of discounting model in the summer months moving forward as a way to generate more overall revenue. So the other one is winter session. There was a $400,000 windfall for us this year because we had some winter classes, which is helpful. Um, you know, because it gives a chance to students to get courses, get them made up. So anyway, so that's another example. We're going to try and take advantage, not that we want to call it a adjustment in the market. I think the dean of business school wants to use the right terminology for what's going on out in the market. But this is the right time to refinance our debt portfolio. We have identified that we can refinance our debt portfolio. We've aggressively put in plan a place to refinance by May 4th, which would give us savings in fiscal 20. Fiscal 21 and fiscal 22 have approximately $7 million. That's a one-time savings, but it's going to help us bridging 20, 21, and 22. Uh, we're trying to utilize any restricted accounts we have on campus. We were notified last Thursday we've got some money left with some capital projects to use for this year. And we also want to try and use some income from the West Side tenants this year and next year before the projects get ramped up. We look for every nickel we can buy, and we think there's some money there for us to recognize before the end of June. Folks who do travel know I reject to travel on a regular basis. It's my favorite thing to do every day. It brings me joy from Boston that I get to reject your travel, all kidding aside. We're really trying to make sure you have budget money to travel if you do travel. We've got some savings from attrition for positions which have been vacant. We've tended to move all hiring from now to July 1st for the next fiscal year, and it was a mandatory budget cut over the last few months to get us in the line. Okay. Yeah.
What do you mean? That? I mean, life is getting crazy. I'm talking about 50 and 80,000 pounds of raises and everything. That's a whole time. A lot of you people come on here to see that salary. Okay. If we have a problem on high rates, a freedom high rate, how is a minister getting all these high salaries? Um, I'm not aware of a fifty or eighty thousand dollar hike since I've been here, but I think what we have is we have the pay program, which means people get an increase probably on July first or September first based on the pay program. There are union staff who get increases throughout the year. It's possible there might be someone who is an interim who went to full time that they may have a salary adjustment but that's dealt with by HR in terms of what the market will bear. I'm not aware of people just getting money. If you want to go down the path of where I think you want to go now, of our personnel staffing budget. I'd say 20%-ish is managers, and the other 80% are union staff and faculty. You could basically do the model. If all administrative staff on campus took a 20% pay cut for, let's just say, a year, you'd probably save about a million, too. It's not where the money is on the staffing budget. It's just, I, wish, I wish I could say we could do that, but it's not going to save. In terms of facilities, we talk a lot about it with Aaron and other people. We want to try and make sure that's taken care of. But the truth is the fact that I can say every group that I'm familiar with on campus, mine own included, we all have open positions that are not filled, and it just makes us have to do more with less on campus. It is what it is. It's not a great story to tell you, but it is what it is. I think that gets more into retention. Right. So the retention is an issue for us to sort of like, as an initiative going forward. Yes, you had another question? I do have a question. Um, I see this, are there numbers attached to this with regards to how much you expect it to be recovered because you have some one, two, three, sure. because you're the next yes. slide? Um, well, no, for the summer session, we expect there'll be, uh, there'll be an increase in our net assets of about a million two, or maybe a little bit more. The refinancing will bring us $7 million over three years, 450,000 this year, and then $3 million the next two years. In terms of utilizing restricted accounts, we've identified about a million dollars there. In terms of the bond proceeds, we have a million dollars to put towards capital this year that we probably didn't have, which will fund the, um, I'm gonna say it wrong, Bernie. Um, what is it, what is the class meeting? What is, what is the business school? Virtual classroom, and then Margaret Williams will get an influx of resources. We have new rental income, we think of 450 this year and maybe more next year. So we have numbers, if you want numbers, we don't want to put numbers on because it's still being finalized. With regard to concurrent travel, we've basically tried to keep people on budget this year, which is sort of good versus them going over budget. The attrition for, for, for B is in the range of a million to a million four. Delayed hiring has given us something, but it's sort of hard because we're kicking these things down four or five months. And the mid-year reductions are in the range of two to three million dollars. So we have numbers for associated with all. If I wanted to look at When you mean worthwhile, worthwhile for the get, because I understand those yeah. recruitment business. Right. And me and if I and directly because I think well, I think it'll be I think it will be hard to the number of reports but I, I think it will be hard to judge the ROI now because if tomorrow Cunningham and the provost take a trip, they might not realize the impact for a year or two. So I think it's all I know is that the travel has been going on for seven years. Yeah. So what I'm saying for this year, I don't think you see an ROI. You probably see an ROI. Okay. I think for me, not being my area, it would be hard to trace what they spent on travel and say this travel to India in 2018 got me these students now, but I, I think there's a portfolio of spending that would generate that, but I don't think it's a trip or a window of time. I think it's going to be hard to trace it, but there is a... Yeah, and, you know, I, I couldn't agree with her more, and one of the things that um, I, Frank Greeny is giving us this $10 million, and he wants to give the other five to the international office. 
a lot of the travel we do right now ends up getting paid for out of the funds from the Chinese uh, Department of Education, it's Confucius Institute. So anytime we go to China, it's, it gets paid for that. If we go, for example, to South America and there's a Confucius Institute down there, we use those funds. So those are funds you can't use for anything but that, uh, for purposes of outreach purposes. But I would agree with you uh, completely, where's Tamara? There you are. Um, this is something that I think we should give people. Uh, Frank is going to give us this other money, and I have told him that I want to be completely transparent about, we, we spent $5, this is what came in, this was the retention. So, and the fascinating thing is, he cares less about that than I do. I'm always like, okay, we got to make sure that if we're going to go do this, what's going to be re return on investment? So, so an example was, so I went to India for two reasons. I have a donor who gives us about $500,000 a year to fund students to come here. Great, that's wonderful. The piece that's the eventual win for us, the day that I get some of those parents there paying for their students to come here, then that's, to me, that's a return. The other is just a complicated process. I got to go do it, and then I come back. One of the things that happened on this particular trip is a gentleman who is very involved with the governor is asking us to do some work with them. So we're at a different level kind of operating now within the state of how we do things. But I need, you're exactly right, I want to do ROI. Do you, do you have any answers? <laughs> First of all, I want to thank Dr. Bozeman for that question. Um, and I want this to be clear that this is the first year um, since we've been doing international and since international has been under my leadership that we even have or had an operating budget. And I just want to confirm that with both Jim and with Lewis. Um, all of the monies for international have been either raised through um, fundraising, donors, and or partnerships with our international partners abroad, including the Chinese government. And so Dr. Henderson is right and accurate when she says a lot of the monies that we receive, even from the Chinese government, we use the, those funds to be able to travel abroad, to be able to establish things like joint degree programs that are now, we are now seeing the ROI on those programs. These programs are what we call three plus one programs, et cetera. And after those three years, the students that you're seeing now, Dr. Bozeman, that, have, that are here at the university are here in their fourth year, and this is the pilot year the, 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 for their final year at NJCU. So we're now seeing those tuition monies coming in. In addition to that, any monies that we receive for funding for international, we help to parlay some of those funds for our domestic students to go abroad. So we're not taking money from the university to just kind of furiously go abroad and just travel. You know, I, I, I wish I had that luxury. It might look luxurious to you, but it's a lot of work to make sure that our students here domestically who may not be able to afford it have the opportunity to have experiences to go abroad. And for international students who may not have had the opportunity to come to America to have what we're calling this American dream at NJCU. So we are very careful about how we spend those funds and we are very careful and diligent about how we go out and pursue those funds internationally. We're happy to give that report to you as well. Yeah, and I would like for this to be something that we do every year because I think it's something I, I'm going to want to do it for the donation just because I want to show that we've got a, it's been a good return on the investment. So, uh, if, if you take an example of that, Stevens University, of, or yeah, University, about five or six years ago, for some reason he had a relationship with a school over in the Middle East somewhere. They get a thousand students now, and it's just helped them kind of. Um, it's helped with their budget, so because they're good school, uh, but it's nice to have an, some extra students around that you know it's a pipeline they come and go. So, yeah, Max. Well, I, I just want to follow up on that because I, I do appreciate the efforts of the international office, um, but I would like to see some numbers on this because we have we have an issue of declining enrollments here, and possibly we can make that up by encouraging more people to come internationally. Yeah, yeah, but if we can just get numbers on that, and if that's part of our budget report here about, I mean, if there are revenues coming in as we expand our international programs, we need to see what those revenues are. We need to see the projections on that, how they're going to, how it's going to contribute to our budget situation moving forward. So that's, that's all I'm saying. Um, 
on understanding the details of the budget. Uh, but I do read the audits each year, which convinces me that I, I am uh, very much uh, uh, have difficulty understanding the finances of the university. I can understand the pieces. I can't put them together to decide whether we're solvent or, or not from the pieces. Um, and you've really answered that question, which is that we're, we're not. Um, and I, I was able to show the budget, however, to somebody, the 2017 audit, to somebody who does understand those things and uh, whose comment was that if we were a private business, we would be out of business, and this is 2017, and that we're fortunate that we're a public university because the state in some way does stand behind you and it does contribute about 20% of our budget. In some ways, I think the state is the real culprit, but we're not going to be able to do anything about that. Uh, when I came here, the state picked up roughly 70% of the, co the operating costs, and it has really declined, uh, declined every year, uh, which forces uh, a lot of the costs on tuition for, uh, for students. And at least in 2017, uh, what we took in from students really didn't quite cover the faculty salaries and the, the operation of that, of that part of the budget. So I, I think some things uh, have been uh, visible uh, for people who do understand it uh, for, for, for years. Uh, and well, I'm, I'm struck by the notion that we're going to be trying to save 30 million in the operating budget in, in one in, in one year, um, no. What, all right, so what is it that we're cutting costs to save? Because I misunderstood. Like Thirty million. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That we were going to try and recover some of what we lost. I think we're going to do it. But. All right. So, no, no, so let's move beyond that and accept that it's my that's my mistake. There are going to be consequences to our financial decision, and my real point to our financial situation. My real point is that. This should be done really much, uh, quite collaboratively, you know, in terms of, of cutting costs. There may be some uh, better ideas out here on the part of uh, well-trained people concerning what costs are more reasonable or have less impact on the operation of the university than, uh, than other costs. There may be, have, be people who have some uh, creative ideas, but at the very least, people should understand that when everything is on the table and there are some choices to be made, uh, the choices are made in a collaborative way. So last Wednesday I was at the shared governance uh, and civility presentation and I was on the shared governance um, committee and one thing that emerged from that was participation in uh, budget, greater participation in budgetary uh, decisions. I think this will um, that faculty and staff will have much more confidence in the decision if it's a participatory process. Thank you. The budget process is participatory. It was last year and it was this year. I think that we've engaged the community, faculty and staff, et cetera. I mean, we're happy. I think I'm going to the faculty senate meeting in March. We're happy to engage the community, but I think we do it in terms of sort of the provosts and deans and directors like that. So I think everyone gets a role in the budget. The question is sort of the fact that the president is going to meet with everybody. Going to make a suggestion on that one? Um, you can hit me later. So what happens is, you know, your chair says, send me what you want for next year. They go and put it on a spreadsheet. It then goes to the dean, and then it goes to the provost, and then, you know. So as I finally say, if you wanted one little thing right here, by the time it gets washed five times, you don't know whether it's going to make it through. And one of the things that might be helpful, I think, for all of us is, is that we're a little more transparent on the other as we're bringing all that together to say, okay, these are the requests, and this is what we can do and what we can't do. And, and I'll address one that Sherry talked about, uh, and I know to be quite true, is that we, we do need some more housekeepers. We absolutely do, and that's just a big commitment. Uh, one of the things I remember in one of my jobs, somebody talking about the fact that you have people here working to make the places that you come to every day very clean, very attractive, and the amount of salary they take home is not what a lot of us take home. And I'm just very honored that, that they're willing to do that and that they do such a great job at it. So we, this is something that has been a commitment. I've asked Andre to, and Aaron to put together, okay, tell me what good looks like. So 
Uh, you're doing a great job. And by the way, do you know that they are doing extra wipe downs now on things so that you, anyway, sorry. <laughs> Just back on the other thing. So, but Barbara, I'm, what I'm gonna recommend to Jim is that as after we kind of get all the stew put in, let's have a conversation about it. So there's more, there's more discussion about it. Is that, would that help? Why uh, an expense here? Why not an expense there? Yeah. You know, why uh, not being able to hire an adjunct when you can fill the adjunct's classroom? You know, some of some of the basic um, operational uh, decisions I think in, on the department um, on the department level. And I think in the end, uh, what departments feel is we're just told no. You know, in the end, I mean, really, as you describe it, people yeah. put forward what their needs are, and, and then they're told, they're told no. <laughs> so, and they don't understand necessarily why, and why money here, and why, uh, so why, why not would, money? Why would be important? Why not money there? And I, and I think this whole process. I've been here, as everyone knows, a long time, and I've seen the university go through numbers of budget uh, crises, and. Uh, two years when they fired virtually all, non all faculty coming up for tenure, and uh, the crises were, were significant, but it hasn't quite been like this uh, either. And, and by the uh, way, we have really, and it's just been a, oh, well, it was a real commitment on the institution. We've had the same number of faculty approximately they had when I walked in the door seven years ago, because it's important that we have a strong faculty and that you have the opportunity now you can be a strong faculty, but if you're not given the opportunity, and again, to do the things that you need to do to thrive, uh, and that's, you know, go to conferences, be able to work with your colleagues, I, I think that that's critically important. So those are some things we will want to focus on because that then helps us with student retention. So, yeah. Well, so I want to follow up on, on Barbara's point um, because one specific issue that this affects is, uh, is class sizes. And that affects everything. That affects retention as well. And what I don't get and I think would be helpful is sometimes classes are canceled um, because they don't meet a certain enrollment figure, but it's not clear whether we're losing money or gaining money on that. My impression is that a number of summer classes, which could actually be gaining us revenue, are canceled because they have low enrollments. But, they, but if you look at it financially, uh, how many students do you have to have enrolled in a class to actually, you know, break even or make money? This is something that we need to know because instead we seem to cancel classes based on some arbitrary number that's not really based on a, on a budgetary issue. And then our students go elsewhere for summer classes. But it's a problem in fall and spring too because we have classes that are, that are heavily enrolled, like fully enrolled to capacity. We could run other sections, and, and I'm not sure we would lose money. We need to know if we lose money if we offer more sections of classes, and that might actually help us with retention too, and we, have, we don't have as many students crammed into a classroom. So I, we need to know the financials on the class So I appreciate sizes that, too. and that's something that I talked with Jim about this morning when we were putting this, the rest of this together, was I really want to spend some time um, with you know, a group of people to talk about what's the model. How do you financially do it? Because there's 4,500 institutions in the country. You can't tell me that you know, somebody hadn't figured out how to do this. So you know, let's take best practices from other places. Uh, we have people who have come from other places that have gone through similar struggles. How do you do it? So can there, I, there are some ways to do it so that you can balance the checkbook. Can, I, can, can I make sure that we get some other things done? Yes. Can I save two seconds? And I've said this 50 times in chairs meetings. I've been here for 26 years, and I was chair for almost 10 years. And so I had very high contact with our students. Our students work full time. A lot of them have families. A lot of them don't know their schedule until the last minute. The financial aid deadlines don't match to class cancellations. It gets too hard. They come in and they say, I can't come to school. And this has been a problem that is built over the years where the class cancellations went further and further and earlier and earlier. And every time I advocated for keeping a class open, it filled in the years that I was chair. It fills at the last second. And the problem is the idea of retention is that we give up on the students. We make it too hard for them and their lives are very complicated. You know, and I've advocated for the students for years and years and years about this. And we're shortchanging them. And so everybody says, oh, retention's down. I can tell you why. They come into my office and they say, it's too hard to go here. 
And it's a problem. When there's no options for a student to take a class to graduate, they can't graduate. It's that simple. It's a one-to-one -one thing. And to save the adjunct kill fee to cut a class that is you know, two students away or three students away from enrollment is a big problem. And that's going to that's gonna kill the university. That's going to be when it's going to be done. Okay. So I just know that we've spent the same money on uh, adjuncts for the last five years, and the enrollment's dropped. So I, I don't know where it is. I don't get into the sausage making of that, but I think it's a project that we all need to work on this spring. So the money's there. Uh, it's the same money we've had since we had 8,500 students, and now we're down to 8,000 students, and we're still spending $9 million a year on adjunct money. So... I'll, uh, some, some, some's got to, we got to figure this thing out. I think it's a problem to be solved. And again, there's a lot of factors to it, but let's make sure we can get it done. Yeah, sure. And also one more thing, there's a lot of things that the students talk about. I um, hear them say there's a lot of courses they don't have here. We're supposed to be one of the most reasonable universities to go to, but there's courses that's not being offered to them. You know, so I think, I know when you first came, you said, let's try to get more courses courses or whatever, we can sit down and talk about it. So that's another thing. It's a lot that we don't offer here at the Dean. Thank you. I, I, Chris would tell me, and we are, we've made a lot of progress on new programs, new academic programs. And, and the good and bad thing about that is that that's going to continue to evolve. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have known seven years ago that I need to be able to teach a data science program or that we might have a relationship with NJTV that I might be able to do something. You know, I, there's things that evolve because of where we are uh, in Jersey City that maybe we think about, are, are there some new things that we ought to be doing and creating? So, thank you. Um, can, can you tell us two things, following two things? Number one, is our debt this year greater or less than our debt the year before? And similarly, will our debt next year be more than our current debt. That's one question I have. The second question I have is, is the following true? Because one of the good things about having a forum like this is that not only are you talking to us, but you're listening to us. And the more listening, I think, the better it would be. Um, so my second question is, is the following true? Uh, that the university is looking around for additional space, real estate, in the area where the School of Business currently is because you want to do some projects that somehow cannot be accommodated in the current space that's provided through the School of Business. So my understanding is, is that the debt on here, the 166.18 to the far right on the right-hand side of the screen, that was the window of time when we did the West Campus piece, and I think we've paid that down the last couple of years since I've been here, so I think we've probably paid that down. So the balance is going down as we speak, if that's your first question. Well, I don't mean just about that. I meant the total debt. And when I talk about that, I, can, I have in mind not only the debt formerly of the university, but any debt that somehow doesn't appear on this because it appears on the balance sheets of the foundation. Because I know there's, a, there's apparently money going back and forth between the foundation and the university, and how those books can be aligned and is a, is a challenge. Because, like Barbara, um, I asked someone who is a professional at this, as you are, to look at this, and the person told me, your school's not going to exist in five years unless something changes, because financially it cannot continue to operate the way it is. So maybe finally this is getting straightened out. But again, so is your answer that next year the debt will be less than it currently is, and that our current debt is more or less than it was the previous year? Right. We're paying down the debt on the West Campus housing, which is on the foundation's books, and what's on these books here. So we're making those payments. There's no additional debt coming on the books as we speak now. So you, just based on that capital budget, you're yep. paying, sorry, you're paying, to answer Joe's question very simply, you're paying off six million in principal every year. Right. So to answer Joe, your debt is going down six million. That's right. And if everything stays the same, where well, we're not taking on any debt, you're right the principal portion goes down six million because six million is, I think our debt is 13 million and he's paying six million in principal and, that's and another six that's million in, yeah. So, so your so debt should be going down six million annually. So therefore the university and the rating, I think it's by Moody's, for the university as well as for the foundation 
ideally will in fact be improved as opposed to the situation that came about last year where it got, the rating was not as good as it had been. So I, I think when we met with the rating agencies in the summer and probably in the fall, which I guess was November, their feedback was they want to see us transition to a balanced budget, which is what we've been talking about most of today. So they want to see that transition when they come out this fall. They want to see us work and strengthen our enrollment, athletic, they want to see a strengthening portfolio. And what they saw this fall was the fact that we probably were transitioning to a different model. But they so, want to see a balanced budget, which is why we're having these discussions. That's one thing that came across in the meeting we had with them, Fitch, which I think was in November. So from an outsider's point of view, if, uh, if the university's rating is improved, then independent of all the explanations that we keep hearing, that would be a measure for me yeah. of saying our financial situation is improved. I think what, what, I, what I think we want as a university is we want them to come back out and say, your rating isn't going to change this fall, Jim, but your outlook will not be negative. If they could say your outlook is good, we feel like, okay, we're Yeah, that, that word negative on that report is, yeah. is not comforting. And, and what about my question about the issue of um, looking for more space beyond the School of Business, which sounds to me, maybe it's needed and maybe it's not, but it does sound like more cost. Um, we're talking more about Mammoth and the PAC. I'm not sure we're talking about anything for the business. The school, so, there, so there's no search right now for additional space near the School of Business that will result in more cost debt for the university. Is that, is that, is that accurate? I'll speak to that slightly. I am aware that there's space uh, adjacent to the School of Business that is unoccupied. Our landlord has contacted us to ask us if we're interested in that space. Uh, we have had a number of faculty complaints that there is a lack of space for them. Their offices are overcrowded. We have three people in two of our student study rooms. So we're exploring an opportunity to see if that's available. Um, as part of that, there will be a restructuring of the existing lease. Again, this is not in my wheelhouse. Uh, we would have to talk to Aaron and Jim about that to see if there's any way to offset additional expenses with savings net. No decisions have been made, and uh, we're just having conversations at this point. Well, it would, first of all, thank you for the information. It would seem to me that if we're in a budget situation, as much as I want to support my colleagues in every way, uh, anything that results in additional costs for us does not seem that wise to me. But thank you for the information. So apparently it's being discussed. Um, perhaps my repeated questions will just make all of you increasingly thankful that I do not teach in the School of Business. Uh, but when we see $47.9 million in the red for 2019, how does that reconcile with a balanced budget? On the financial report, it says the net position of NJCU for 2019 is minus $47.9 million. That, al that also includes... That's published on NJCU's website. It also includes some of the pension issues, so we need to get slides out that net but, that... But can you, can you, like, tease that out a little bit? How does that balance with... How does that reconcile with a balanced budget? What happens here is the fact that if we lost $13, $14 million last year, the other 40 or 30 or so was the pension piece. Okay, but how are you going to balance the budget? To balance the budget? I think the difficulty is I can't balance the pension budget because it's a massive amount of money that sort of, we would have to sort of, you know, change the structure here and there. But I think that the, the commitment we're talking about is to go from $13 million to zero in a year is the goal. The pension piece is what it is. I could try and balance it, but then we would have no discretionary budget at all. It would just be faculty and staff. And yes, but even the $13 million aside, that still leaves um, $34 million in the red. Can, right. Which, can I, this seems like an unachievable goal. I think it'll be hard to balance that pension differential as a university because in a sense it would change the entire university. We had to either increase tuition or cut all your costs to get down to that $30 million. We've I, not been tasked with that. We've been tasked with balancing the operating budget, but I, I, I could say I'm concerned, but I don't know what to do about that $30 million because it's just kicked from the state down to me. Can I, can I try to give a, um, like a personal ex, uh, a personal uh, example that might help explain the difference between the university's net position and our operating budget. So in much the same way that um, you own a home and the value of that home over a two-year period could plummet, um, 
and you might end up actually owing more on that home than it's worth um, just because of the change in the value. That, that is sort of what that net position balance sheet is showing us. Um, and that is totally separate from your personal checkbook, which might be running at a balance, even though something beyond your control has caused your net, the value of your net assets, assets that you own, to decrease. Um, and that, so that's kind of the difference between the university's operating budget um, and that um, financial statement, which is showing the university's net position. I don't, so they're not, they're somewhat related, but they're not, um, they're not the same thing, and, so, and you can't, um, you know, in the same way that you can't control the value of your home suddenly plummeting in the market, um, we had no, have no control over sort of the accounting standards that were put in place that required us to put this um, liability on our, on our balance sheet. I don't know if that helps <clears throat> sort of differentiate between the two um, things. I, I think of it that way. The operating budget is like our checkbook. How are we... Um, you know, ensuring that within a one-year period that we're not spending more than we're bringing in, um, and then net assets are much more complicated um, and, and uh, in many ways beyond our control um, because of accounting standards that apply um, so to that. that we've depleted our reserves, is that true? I'm sorry? There's a rumor going around that we've depleted our reserves, $30 million in reserves, is that true? Our checkbook's empty, using his, his example. No, I check books. I check. We still have a reserve. We do. We do. Um, the president and I look at those cash reserves every Friday. We have reserves to get us through this year. Looking into next year, we track the cash reserves every Friday. We take it very seriously. How, how much is there in the reserves? We'll know Friday. We have payrolls Friday. What's that? How much was it last Friday? Um, I, so I, I, I mean, I'll go ahead and. So what happened? It, it, we used to have probably about 30, 45 million dollars in reserves, and that's what's gone down because of our operating budget over the past few years. We've spent more than we've, we've our enrollments declined, and we've continued to keep our budgets where they were. And an example of it that kind of became like I didn't realize it is we had projected that we were going to bring in a certain amount of money in summer two last summer, so that was in the budget. Great, we're going to bring a million dollars in. Well, no, it was actually going to be like two and a half million. Well, it only ended up being a million. So there was a million and a half that we had put in our budget for us to all spend for which there wasn't revenues. So we had to kind of scramble around and say, wait a minute, we weren't smart about how we projected that, that enrollment. You know, not just the enrollment, but the real cash that comes in. So that's an example of it. So, yeah. Does that make it's sense? Little, it's a little scary because of the amounts. Because right. So there, that's, and that's why... That's it's unpredictable. We don't know. We can't count on that. It sounds like there's an accountability issue where, you know, the spending is out of sync with potential income. That's, I mean, you got it. Level, that's, that's, you it right that's, that's, that's it right there. That's it right there. Who's in charge of making those decisions? It's not yeah. me. Yeah. So, so the, it's got, there's two parts to that decision. Is what's the real money coming in, and then what's the budget that you spend? So what Jim's suggesting next year, you'll see it, is that what we're going to do is we're going, to, we're going to assume that we're not bringing a lot of money in. Are and quite frankly, reasons? what you're la I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think what you're having to live off right now is probably very close to what we'll have to be doing next year. So the way the budget's ended up this year, sort of where it is, then I'm, what I'm hoping people will do is, okay, I can do this, but I really need this thing. So there's a delta we're going to have for like an innovation fund. We'll say, okay, this stuff right here really has got to be done. If there's some key things that they're doing in the nursing department that have been cutting edge, that are going to help bring things forward, we need to keep funding those few things. But the rest of us, we have to really be thinking where we are. Now, think about where we are. The adjunct budget, $9 million. It stayed that way for five years. How you use it, I don't know. So can I address one thing? And I know this is off topic, but none. Joe, you're right, and, and I'm right. <laughs> I didn't write a check for $10,000. Um, and you could have. <laughs> your money, it's and your neither money. didn't. But what happened, and I don't know if how many of you remember, we had a gentleman by the name of Mark Rosenblum who does work uh, around the country with students from Harvard and Yale and um, UCLA. And he does something called the Ibrahim program where he has students try to understand the Middle Eastern conundrum. Um, what, are, what are the Israelis? What are the Palestinians? What are the Jordan the people who live in Jordan? And how do they get along? Where, where are things that are going well there? 
So he, he said, I would like to include some students. I would like to include some students from NJCU. And here's why. My students from Harvard, my students from Yale, UCLA, they all fit a certain profile, and none of them have the diversity that your campus has. So I would like to teach a class. We had him do it one semester or as an adjunct, or maybe you had one of our faculty members teach it, and it was on the Middle East. And then part of that was that we had to send those students to this one two-week program in Israel where they visited a lot of really impressive things that are happening there, where the Palestinians are working with the Israelis, where the Jordanians are doing something. Where they went to Oman where they're teaching women to drive, which is very countercultural. But the thing that was the win, he said, for not for our students, but for the kids from Harvard and Yale, is that it was the diversity of our students. And I remember one of the students, she said, I'm a born-again Christian, and I was there with a Muslim and, and a Jewish person. So for them to understand, so that's where that money went. So we don't do it anymore because he he's not doing that program no, anymore. So it was budget money. You're right. It was. It was $10,000. It was NJCU's foundation money to send those students, send our students abroad. Does that make sense? It's like five of them that yeah, went. I'm aware of that program. Okay. Didn't know it was yeah, but yeah, we had to fund it. So. We just have about five minutes left, so I thought we could just go through the one last section. We just have five minutes left. I don't want to. Sorry, I, I just. So I wanted to rephrase Joe's question a little bit because I, I, I'm not planning on retiring anytime soon. I'm going to be here for the long run. I want to know about the long-term sustainability of this institution as well. So. I'm going to try and be an optimist about this, that, there were, that there, we went into debt in order to start building things, building new buildings, new programs, we're reaching out to international. What I want to know is, is there a point, can you give us like projections of when you think there'll be a point in the future when we stop, <laughs> when we do actually balance this budget and when we do start going back into the black? So I think the one slide we wanted to cover before we finish up is we're really thinking about a model of NJCU that kind of looks beyond six to nine months. We're thinking about next year's budget on campus revenues expense. We're thinking about what does Fort Monmouth look like in year one or year two? What does the PAC look like in year one and year two? And that's going to require a discussion we're going to have here. But we think as we're getting into 21, 22, and 23, the learning curve and the cost curve there ends up sloping up, which means in a couple of years, let's say fiscal 24, 25, we see it as being the projects are up and running, they're fully sustainable to utilize, and then the resources tend to be the surpluses would help NJCU. That's kind of what we're looking at. So the idea is being that we want to take Monmouth and the PAC and put them on a schedule and say, what impact does it have on us in 21 and 22? That's sort of the vision. So we do get that we need to look beyond this for a three-year model, and we think this will help. But there's a lot of opportunities for us here with regard to that. But the one we're really thinking about now is the impact those budgets have on us in the next couple of years. That's it. We're just running over on time. Sorry. sophomore, junior, junior, senior, retention rate by, uh, if we increase it by just 5%, uh, like right now our freshman sophomore retention rate is at 74, 3, okay. If we could get it to 78, and then the freshman, the sophomore to junior, just increase them all 5%. That would bring us about an additional 144 students, which based on the fact that they go at we do a 16% discount, and they go at about 88%. They all don't go for time. Some of them are part-time. Uh, we figured out you ended up about a million and a half more money. And that gives us a contingency for fiscal 21. Yeah. Just using simple math. 5%, so run it through pretty quick. Back with the envelope this morning. Gives about a million. And that'd be great. That would give us a reserve contingency. That would give us some money next year to invest in. <coughs> That's kind of how we think it through. Do you have No, we don't. Uh, we, have a, we have a growing number of online programs, and that's a real good question. Um, I think that's an opportunity for us. Uh, I, know, I know Gloria's not here, but my board chair has been chomping at my ears for years about getting the, some of the nursing stuff on time. His wife's a nurse, so. But, uh, you know, if we could think about that, that's a great opportunity for us. And the reason it's such a good opportunity is uh, students, even though they may, may want to take some of their classes here on campus, they also may want to do some of them online. So, uh, that I think is a great opportunity. What else? Yeah. I'm sorry. 
in summary, with all these millions of numbers, what is our deficit? What's our deficit now? Yeah. Our deficit as of January 31st is about $6 million. We've identified $3 million in the last month trending to get to a balanced budget by June 30th. So we're going from basically six to three, and every day we try and get that balanced budget to be a reality. Yep. Did, did you ever have to borrow money in order to make payroll? Have I here? Has, has NJCU not since ever I've been here. Not borrow since, in yeah. order to make payroll? Not since I've been here. I have not done that. Well, you've been here a year and a half. Correct. I mean, I've been here for the You've never borrowed to make payroll. Good. How much are reserves now? Yeah. So the reserve. We're, proje we're projecting yeah. our reserves this June to be similar to where they were last year, which was ten to ten to fifteen million dollars. Ten to fifteen million dollars. The reason they jump up and down, which is kooky, but it is what it is. So I told you we were building this road out there that the city's paying for. We have to spend four million. So we may spend the four million and it's March. And we go knock on the city store and says, we need our four million. Do you know when they'll write that check? The very last day of June, because they do not want to write the check till they have to. We have to hound them like bill collectors. So if, how much cash you have in the bucket it isn't always just flat because of uh, some of these what I call chunky expenditures. You know, I always give Aaron a hard time. I said, you just do everything so chunky, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> two million at a time in and out the door. Whereas, you know, if we think about what you do in your budgets and your, uh, you know, in your departments, it's much smaller. So, but that's where I, that's why you said it, it kind of comes at a, and then it's when the, the state's pretty good about giving us money. I've worked in places where the state is, they give us that, tw it's 24.2 24 million dollars a year. So, plus there's another 23 million in pensions, uh, uh, the pension coverage, <laughs> which we get the debt for. <laughs> the debt we're getting, by the way, that pension liability is for the people who've already retired. It's not the money they're paying in right now, it's for the people who've already retired from here. So as more people retire, <laughs> there's more pension liability. Thank you. Thank you. I'm at the business. Is the business for me? <laughs>